Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 16th, 2016, and my guest is Chris Blattman, the Ramalee E. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the University of Chicago in the Harris School of Public Policy and a research associate at NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research. He previously appeared on Econ Talk in July of 2014, talking about giving cash to poor people as a way to fight poverty as opposed to less direct methods. And today he's back talking about a different research project he's been working on, trying to figure out whether working in a factory is better for the poor, what is sometimes called a sweatshop, than informal self-employment. Chris, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thank you. Now, you begin your paper, which is co-authored with Stefan Durkan, pointing out that a lot of anti-poverty programs uh, for uh, – in, in the name of development, try to help poor people become more successful entrepreneurs. Uh, they're typically self-employed. Let's talk about what some of those programs are and what we've learned about their success or failure. Sure. So, I mean, I think a lot of these programs fall into a few categories. A lot of them give, and I think the best ones give capital to the poorest people, um, and some of them give skills. They're, us- they're basically giving some kind of input into production because these people are producing. And, and one of the reasons I think is just because in most of these very poor countries, there are very few firms. And so being employed meaning means being self-employed and that could be your farm. It could be being a petty trader. It could be some really, uh, you know, crude manufacturing. And, and so, so basically giving people inputs that they otherwise have, have difficulty getting. Yeah. In these kind of situations, I see somebody sitting on a stool outside a, a poor dwelling offering something for sale or a service inside, right? I think that's right. Or one of these, you know, you, you know, you sort of walk around a village or a, a city and you see just shop after shop selling the same crummy goods, the same maybe twenty things, matches and soap, and 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 you kind of wonder. And that's an employment of a sort. Uh, you kind of wonder how any of them are making any money. Or presumably they're not making very much. No. So when we think about adding capital to that activity, capital is a big fancy word, but um, sometimes that would mean right. a, a factory. Sometimes it means a wheelbarrow, right. uh, and sometimes it just means some cash to borrow so that they can invest in something, a tool, a very basic tool, right? So it could mean – so a lot of the time it means livestock and it means um, it means inventory and – is basically what what people do. So so if you give them those things directly, or if you give them cash, which is what we talked about last time, people tend to actually take these things that don't look super profitable on the face of it. They 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 expand the stock of this store from you know ten crummy items to thirty crummy items, or they they get a goat or two, or they get a, some chickens or maybe a cow, and uh, and and that's how they sort of expand what they're what they're doing a little bit. And, and so these, and the, the funny thing is these programs tend to be pretty successful. So when, when, when we've done randomized evaluations of giving people cash of giving people goods that they could use in a business by helping them expand their inventory, uh, it turns out these shops, you know, they're not super profitable, but they, they do a little bit better. And so it, they go from earning $2 a day to $4 a day, or they go from earning $5 a day to $10 a day. And that's that's not a whole lot, uh, but when you consider how cheap some of these interventions can be, they're not always, but how cheap they can be, it's, that's a pretty good return. And, and if you only earn, earn two bucks a day, an extra two bucks a day makes a really big difference. For sure. And also just it's a cushion if things don't go well for a while. There's illness. There's all kinds of, of course, un- uncertain and unexpected events. But one question I have about this whole research agenda is when, when, when a, as an outsider to the development world, meaning I, this is not my expertise, right? You're, you're in mm-hmm. it, and I'm I'm an outsider who's very very interested in it, but I'm not in it. Yeah. And 
the actual kinds of aid that that occur – well, some of them are happening as part of an experiment, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, you get – or an economist gets a grant or has some funds to find out how people respond to uh, various things. And that's interesting. It's interesting about the human condition. It's interesting about how work is in poor countries. Um but when I think about, quote, global aid, when I think about, say, money that the U.S. government spends or an aid agency, uh, is that the kind of thing they're going to actually do is is go around to poor merchants on the streets of a terribly poor city and give them a little bit of money? Uh, in other words, what, what kind of infrastructure is there to implement these kind of lessons? Right. Well – there's just so many forms of aid and it's, it's, it's a really, even if it's, even if we don't give very much to say a percentage of income here, that's still a, a small percentage of a really big number turns into a big number. So people spend money on a, aid, aid gets spent on a lot of things. There, there is, there's a significant amount that, that turns into these kinds of employment programs or cash transfer programs. Here's a couple of examples. One in, you know, the, you know of all of the, the millions of, Syrian refugees throughout the that region, whether they're in Lebanon or Jordan or Turkey, have ATM cards. In fact, they probably have a wallet with six ATM cards. One is from the UN High Commission for Refugees, and one might be from the International Rescue Committee, and one might be from another organization. And those organizations, when they instead of giving out sacks of grain or tarps like they might have in the past, or they might still in a really remote uh, region. These are these are refugees who are not in remote regions. You don't need tarps or grain. They need to to survive, uh, and so they transfer cash onto these ATM cards. And so the infrastructure there is 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 extremely is extremely simple in some ways, and, and it needs to be simplified. But that's very effective. And then in places where that doesn't exist, or even in the recent past where you didn't have so many ATM cards, so some of the cash transfer programs I studied in Uganda, the Ugandan government gave out had a $300 million program, which was basically cash transfers to groups of youth and to communities for some of that was for starting businesses. Some some of that was for livestock purchases. Some of that was for, um, some of that was for, uh, community goods building like little bridges or a teacher's house or something of this nature. And that's, that was the second biggest program in the history of the country. So, so the these you know countries are doing this on a large scale, either with their own money or with aid money. I can't help but note that while we don't aren't as likely to give a tarp to a poor person in a third world country, we're still giving tarps to rich people in America. That's a little finance joke. Uh, I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Um, troubled asset relief program, I think, is what it stood for. Uh, the three hundred million that the Uganda government gave that's out of their tax revenue. Who's funding that? Well, that was the credit from the World Bank. So the okay. World Bank – so and a lot of aid comes in the form of subsidized credit. And so in this case, the World Bank provides a very low interest loan to Uganda and the Ugandan government has conceived of this program. Now, they've they've done so with some of the some, – some advising from the World Bank because the bank is – See, I think they'd done this in Tanzania, and the Tanzanian government was very happy with it, and so they they sort of helped transfer some of these programs. And and so I, the idea is they'll pay this back eventually. Now, if if it fails, probably those loans would get forgiven. But if they succeed, and this program seems to have succeeded, then the idea is that this helps you grow your economy now, and then you have the tax revenues in future to to make that taking that loan worthwhile. Boy, that sounds optimistic, but <clears throat> well, I guess we'll find out. Well, that's true. It's a nice I mean, idea. The been, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of the the average African country has been growing. I, I can't remember the exact percentage, but somewhere between probably six and eight uh, percent, not per capita, but overall over the last decade, maybe even for fifteen years. So yeah. that's that's not bad. And yeah. I think I personally think aid is a part of that. I don't think it's I, th- I don't think it's the major part of that, which is why I ended up taking interest in factories and industrialization, but I but I do think it's been an important part. So before we turn to uh, industrialization, I want to ask you about private efforts. Are there private uh, charities that are trying to fund these kind of microfinance or small cap, you know, infusions of capital for an entrepreneur in a in a very poor setting like we've been talking about? 
So I'd say most of the innovation has been with private organizations and, and they've often then been picked up and scaled by governments. And so whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's organizations, you know, there's a whole host of organizations that are giving out these ca cattle and livestock along with various skills where there's been randomized control trials in several countries. So I think BRAC is an example of an organization that does this uh, all over the world. Um, the International Rescue Committee is a private organization that's doing this in the in the Syria region, as well as other conflict affected places. Give Directly is a famous example of of, of of an organization trying to give cash in the simplest, cheapest way possible, which is which is arguably the best way to make sure that that this intervention passes some kind of cost benefit test. At least that people don't starve to death. I, you know, I think there's a it's a big difference. Uh, they're both important, but there's a big difference between keeping someone from uh, death, uh, making sure they're quote above subsistence, that they're mm -hmm. that they don't fall into tragedy. And on the one hand, and growth, which is a much more ambitious and I think more challenging thing. So if you think about an undeveloped, whatever you want to, it's not, it's not an easy word to describe, but I, let's call it a barter economy mm -hmm. uh, where people are, are making small um, amounts of, of something right. and, and then trading it with their neighbors. Perhaps they're reselling things they purchased, so they're acting as a, a middleman. Uh, those kind of that's better than being self sufficient. We know that as economists, but it doesn't translate into growth. There's no engine there to push that higher, right? If I'm so if I if I have an act if I have access to a supply of matches and you have access to a supply of soap, we might swap and we might use cash to make that easier so that we can trade more effectively. But it's not mm -hmm. likely to lead to growth. So that. Under some circumstances, that's true. Under others, it's not. And I, you know, I don't know if we know exactly what kind of world we're in in a lot of these places. But one of the things is, is that if you think that um, there are actually a lot of opportunities for these really small entrepreneurs to go from selling or manufacturing, you know, a few matchbooks to manufacturing more matchbooks, or from producing so much, you know, a small amount of milk to a larger amount of milk. Uh, but if you think that there are really fundamental breakdowns in the credit and the insurance markets, which is basically a perfect description of a lot of rural villages, then providing a one-time amount of capital, be it like a cash grant or providing regular cash transfers, which, which acts as a form of insurance as well as providing capital, uh, can lead people to, to grow businesses that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to grow. And, and and maybe take risks that they otherwise would not have sensibly taken. And and so you can get growth. But but again, you know, even then, you know, when you look at here, here's something that, that the thing that stimulated my interest in industrialization in general was was while working on this I, as a graduate student, I actually spent a little bit of time helping write a report for the World Bank on the Kenyan manufacturing sector. So I was in Kenya, I was doing other things and 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 I was roped into this. And the thing that still sticks with me to this day is was some statistic, and, and I should probably remember what the exact number was, but this was something like 14 years ago, was was something like five percent of the country's workforce was in manufacturing, but they produced something like half the national income and uh, or, or or the gross domestic product. And the reason was because these manufacturing uh firms were just so productive. They added so much value. They they combined all of this capital and technology and people's labor to produce so much more value than these farmers. So so you could double the income of every farmer in the country, but because they make very, very little and they're producing very little income and they're not very productive, that would make them a lot better off. That's These are the kinds of programs that I work on all the time, but they're, you're not going to have a huge impact on national income. Um, you're not going to transform the economy. And so so you can get growth if you resolve these credit constraints and insurance, and you can make people a lot better off. And that's a really important, uh, yeah, important serve of, is service of aid. But but you're not going to – the growth you're going to get is – I think is – I don't know that there's many people who think that's going to be very transformative or, or, or dramatic. Yeah, just a couple of comments. The 5% making – creating 50% of the GDP is 
partly a result probably of the inability to count some of the economic activity that's taking place in the informal True. structures. But still, the point I'm sure is real that we're really talking about Adam Smith's pin factory, that specializ- yeah. specialization drives uh, – Productivity, divisional labor is limited by the extent of the market. If you don't have a lot of people to sell to, it's not worth it to invest in capital to make more soap or more matches. If you have a bigger market, you're, you're in a bigger village or you're in a city, you can obviously uh, change your production process and eventually you get to industrialization, you get to a factory. The other thing I just want to comment on, I don't have a way to say this very, uh, very well. And so I'm going to ramble here for a minute or so and get see if you can maybe clean it up for me, but it seems to me we don't, as economists, have very good understanding of of, of the sort of the nature of, of the dynamics of, of an economy. So if you think about a village, I was trying to invoke, a, I call it a barter economy. It's not really the, the right word, but people are, you know, they're, they're self-producing. They're not, they're not uh, in factories. They're not cooperating in large numbers to produce lots of stuff. Each person makes something. And or resells something or adds a couple of things together and makes something and they trade it and they buy it and they, they buy other stuff from other people and they sell the stuff they can make, whether it's livestock output or f- food from farming or whether it's small, small scale production like like clothing made by hand. And there's just an inherent limit. And this is really, again, I'm coming back to Adam Smith, there's an inherent limit to how much prosperity – that kind of situation can produce. You can you can shower them with money. Uh, it's not going to have a big impact if it's a small group of people interacting. When it's a larger group of people interacting, there's the potential for what we'd call economies of scale or f- industrialization or factory production. Then, yes, there can be barriers to, of capital that keeps entrepreneurs from from creating those institutions, those in, those those type of companies and firms. But it just seems to me to be a big difference between a village, which is going to inherently be somewhat poor, and a city that is going to have the possibility of uh, the kinds of economies of scale that that Smith and, and we're interested in. Does that make sense? So I think it's it's true, but at the same time, you know, I've if if you traveled across different countries in Africa or even different countries in Latin America for argument's sake, which are the places that I know better. And you went from rural area to rural area, village to village. It's true that you might, you might, you, you'll never find a, like a Singapore there. You'll never find a, you'll, you'll very seldom find an enormous amount of, you know, first world level production. But here's the thing. You, you will find that some villages in some places or even in the same country are 10 or 20 times as wealthy as other villages. And, and 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 a lot of that is because they're they've been become better at producing uh, and better at organizing and 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 just more productive in general. And so there is a lot of room for variation. So 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 you can you can you can get a lot of growth, I think, and and you can make a lot of strides in terms of quality of life and infant mortality and all of the things that we care about. And and it, you know. Things that are just inc- like the marginal utility, like the, the the benefits we get a little bit on the margin from from those advances are so huge yeah, yeah, I agree. that you can so that that so so there's a lot of room. I don't want to you know I don't want to leave people with the impression that that it's all about urbanization and industrialization. That there's a lot of benefits to to being able to become more productive at agriculture and small scale production. Yeah, that's well said. I just I think there's a. Uh there's a discontinuity of sorts there. There's a, um, you know, I like to think of it as you put a hundred, the hundred most talented people, you can pick them. I'll let you pick who they are, and you put them on an island with no outside exchange possibilities. And you can give them all the technology you want. You can give them all the resources. They, it can be an island full of oil underneath it, and and all kinds of metals underneath it, and beautiful rich soil. But a hundred people can't be very wealthy. Now, a hundred people trading with, um, you know, a billion people can be wealthy. Uh, so I'm right. not suggesting that we have to get everybody into the cities. Obviously, a well-developed uh, uh, urban sector can can help uh, a well-developed rural sector thrive with through their interactions. But I just think mm-hmm. 
when, when we think about, quote, growth as opposed to, again, decent standard of living or minimal standards above subsistence, there's something a little different going on there. But your point about the variation is huge. Obviously, small villages can be much better off than other small villages if they do things well. And and I you know I've been very surprised. I some of the projects I've worked on, I and, and and things I've studied, I've often assumed that a lot of these isolated rural villages uh, are really little economies under themselves and are somewhat cut off, and, and and the markets aren't very integrated across these villages or with the city. And I've generally been surprised. I think that there's a lot of exchange going on. And, and so that's in some sense the secret. When I when I say that I think there's actually a lot of potential in these villages, I think it's in part because there's a lot of potential for these villages to say turn to cash crops or animal production or things and then sell into the cities and, and so engage in this kind of trade. So they're not a hundred people out on an island. They're, they're, there's definitely some costs to getting things to market. That that is another source of poverty, um, but roads, the, transportation, road, infrastructure, yeah, exactly, ports, all of these yeah. things, and or even just just having access to a bicycle, or or frankly, you know, big a big challenge. I think I think in Africa is that there's never never has really been much in the way of draft animals because of the disease environment, and so that that holds things back as well, and so so. So as as a consequence, um, I think they're 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 reasonably integrated. And this is where the this is where some of the opportunities lie. There there is an ability to trade with the rest of the world, to trade with that billion people, and and get some pretty serious gains. So let's uh, now turn to the other possibility, uh, which is going to be the focus of the paper: the comparison between the informal, self employment, entrepreneurial environment of of small scale production versus being an employee. So this we're going to call this um, uh, a sweatshop. Uh, it's a it's a um, it's, for better or for worse. It's become a term to describe relatively low paying employment in a poor place, uh, in a factory or, or a larger workspace. Um, what what is your or what, before you did this research? What was your preconception about that kind of opportunity for for the uh, poor in in uh, in very poor countries? Sure. I mean, well, the first thing I should say, sort of by way of a disclaimer, is I, I didn't then, and even to some extent now, I'm not uh, I'm not I'm not a, much of a factory expert. This has been this has been sort of a uh, a new journey for me. And and as you know, not only do I spend a lot of my time mostly thinking about poverty alleviation in the poorest places, but I actually, you know, my main thing is studying violence and gangs and rebellion and things of this nature. So, so factories have been, um, something that for better, for worse, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure I had the, I guess I had the idea that a lot of economists and a lot of my colleagues sometimes voiced, which was different than maybe the pessimistic view that, that some people have about sweatshops. I would, occasionally see a factory. And, and, and like I said, I had a little bit of exposure to Kenyan factories. There were a few firms, a few industrial firms in Uganda. And when those firms had a set of jobs or when they opened up a new production line and say they needed 50 people, you'd see a lineup of 300 people for that job, if not more. And and so there's this very you know basic idea of revealed preference that if if people are standing in line waiting for these jobs, these jobs must be pretty good and and people are queuing for this employment and and so that was my first impression and and you would even see some sweatshop activist organizations saying things like well you know as as bad as these jobs are and you know we have they have this agenda to try to improve what Nike's doing or improve what what some other organization is doing in a in a poor country they say as bad as these jobs are they're still better than most people's alternatives in this informal sector this sector where they're self-employed producing agricultural goods or, or, produ- or running these small crummy little shops. Um, and so, so that's, uh, that, that was my first impression that as bad as these are, it's better than people's alternatives. And here I am spending all this time trying to get a program that can help some, you know, poor somebody go from $2 a day to $4 a day. And maybe I'm missing out on the action, maybe I need to be spending more time thinking about how to help that 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 produce help that five percent of the population produce fifty percent of the wealth. Maybe I have to sort of think about how to 
how to sort of illustrate that sweatshops are are the answer, not cows or cash transfers, and 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 get some get the international community focusing a little bit more on that. Yeah, I'm reminded of I think it's in the Coconuts Marx Brothers movie where uh, Groucho, who's running, who's a manager of a hotel, says uh, gathers the staff together and says. Um, you don't want to be wage slaves, do you? And they say no. And he says, well, you know what causes wage slaves? Wages. So I'm not going to pay you, and that way you won't be a wage slave. <laughs> and and you, you echoed this in your paper. Your, your paper's worth reading just for this one line for me. It said uh, – you write, as the economist Joan Robinson remarked – and Joan Robinson was a, a great British economist uh, in the early and middle 20th century. Her quote is, the misery of being exploited by capitalists – is nothing compared to the misery of not being exploited at all. And this is an issue that I, you know, it's very, it, it's really a deep, it seems obvious to most economists that that's true. But, you know, I think it's a hard issue for a lot of people to to think about and deal with that your shoes or whatever it is you're wearing or buying is made by people who are very poor and are paid very little. And it's true that it's better than their alternatives, but still not very much. And I think that that's, uh, that's a, an issue we're not going to grapple with, but I think it has to it has to be mentioned. But but the point is is that people do line up for these, as you say, and of course they line up for Walmart jobs in the United States, and people complain about that too. And I I take the attitude that I, I don't know how to solve all the problems of the world at one time, but when I see people desperately trying to do something, I assume they they're trying to better themselves and and probably know more about their situation than I do. Right, and I and I think on top of that, I had this sense that. Okay, even if these jobs aren't much better than other people's alternatives, that uh, you know, a couple things are going to happen. So first of all, I thought these jobs are better than the alternatives, but and then I thought over time this was going to be doubly the case. On the one hand, you would see the manufacturing sector advance over time, uh, one hopes, and 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 the quality of the jobs would improve, and the skills they need, and the worker commitment and productivity they need, and so you would you would see wages rising over time potentially in this sector. So you might send people, the people who are lucky to get these jobs, in that moment, the job might not be that much better, but it might send them off on this virtuous cycle. And and then the second thing, which is which is where people like Paul Krugman and Jeff Sachs, who are two very prominent economists, had come out in the last 10 or 20 years, they, they'd said things like, what we need is more sweatshops for Africa. And their reasoning was not this reason that I necessarily thought was the case, that people are lining up because these are better jobs. But their point was that, you know, there's there's a lot of people who are underemployed in these relatively unproductive things like agriculture and all the other kinds of crummy businesses we've been talking about. And the more that factories grow and suck them up and export to other countries, then the more opportunities there are for farmers to and the more incentives there are for farmers and these small business people to actually invest in capital and improve their opportunities because they're not competing with nearly so many farmers and and the returns to investing in that capital like getting a farm combine or getting a better store are going to become more attractive they get to specialize in producing those things while these other people go off to work in factories and then buy their food and buy their haircuts and buy all of their other things. So, so there's, there's that double effect. And, and, and we, you know, we weren't in a position to measure that sort of big macroeconomic effect where you're sucking up all this labor. We weren't going to be able to do that in a study, but we could test this idea of how do, how do people choose between occupations and and what are the benefits and risks that come with these different occupations? And the last part I want to make before we get to the actual details of what, of the research is that it's it's clear that um, hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people in China and India have improved their standard of living by leaving agriculture, coming to the cities and working in factories, producing goods for people around the world. And that's just – a reality that's just phenomenal. How, whether we can make that happen in in Ethiopia or Uganda, Uganda or Kenya is a different question. Whether someone can make that happen is a different question. But it's certainly true that industrialization is a, um, at least on a material basis, which is not the only thing that counts. You know, mm-hmm. you, you can call a business crummy; it may be crummy by our standards, but there may be some dignity involved there for the person and their family that we're not aware of, and. 
well, I guess we'll be talking about that. So you can react to that if you want. You can start talking about the study. Well, I, I guess I'd only say just to give a bit of context, it is happening. So, for example, I um, when I was working in Ethiopia, when I first started working there in about 2009, what was interesting, first there were a lot of, there were a lot of there were a lot of like Ethiopian owned factories that were uh, expanding operations and they were starting to export things to Europe. So there were a lot of, there were a lot of, a lot of companies that were starting to send chives or spinach or, uh, you know, t-shirts and things to European markets and shoes. And these, these were just growing and growing and growing um, in part in response, I think to basically like a stable well, they, basically, they're, they're close to Europe. There's a lot of, you know, Ethiopia. A lot of people think of Ethiopia as, you know, they, they, they remember these, these um, you know, Bob Geldof and singing about starving children. And, and there is a little bit of that in the periphery of, of Ethiopia, uh, towards Somalia, towards Sudan. These are lowland areas. They're very, they're very hot. They're very dry. And, and 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 people there's there, there's a lot of drought and there's so there's a lot of there's a lot of problems people there's a lot of famines from time to time um but the 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 middle of ethiopia the highland area is incredibly prosperous by comparison is green it's the source of the nile there's there's not there hasn't really ever been any kind of problem with getting people fed and and the levels of state organization and the levels of education and the levels of sort of capabilities of firms and civil society are very, very high. And, and so there are all these companies. And then not only were these domestic companies growing up, but you had what was so interesting to me at the time is you had all of these Indian, Bangladeshi and Chinese companies and some American and European companies starting a toehold. So you'd see this huge, vast area, this industrial park that was empty. And then there was one factory uh, and this factory basically had would would maybe was an Indian entrepreneur, a Chinese entrepreneur, and they had maybe 500 or 1,000 employees. And you'd say, why do you have all of this land? And they said, well, we're we're getting ready. We're trying this out. We think this is a pretty good place to be. There's there's lots of people. There's a domestic market. We can export to Europe. It's very close by, especially at the time oil prices were high. So being closer to Europe is helpful. And the wages are going up in China and the wages are going up in India and the way, just like the wages went up in Mexico as these areas got more productive. Um, and so this is where we're gonna plant our foot next, we think. And so we're gonna test it out. And if things go well, in a few years, you'll see 10,000 or 20,000 people working here. And, and, and there's a lot of that going on. And it's not just going on near the capital, it's going on in sort of the rural hinterlands and in this Northern city and in that small town. Uh, in agriculture and textiles. So it's, you know, it's, you kind of have this feeling of, wow, we're on the cusp of something maybe really big. And we're talking about Ethiopia. I don't know anything about Ethiopia or very little. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of government do they have? And did, did it change to make this kind of investment imaginable or is this more just, um, and why is it Chinese or Indian? Why isn't it internal and, and something's going on there? Right. Well, so, I mean, this is happening in a number of countries and it's, it's, so, so, the, you know, these, there's a, the, the short answer, it's difficult to give a short answer to Ethiopia there, um, but I'll try. I, I will say that it's going on in a lot of places where there's different kinds of government. So Ethiopia is relatively authoritarian. It's sort of taking as its model China or to some extent Vietnam, where it's going to have some, uh, you know, it's a relative, it, it's sort of a communist and socialist influenced government that came to power and as part of a revolution, as part of a, a civil war, and is repressive in many ways, uh, but is also very, um, very serious about uh, sort of a, this marriage of private sector and public sector development and, and, a, and some state influence development, but one where there's a, there's a humongous amount of private investment. And but but it's also happening in Kenya, where you have a, a much more democratic regime with 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 other problems, corruption and things of this nature. But but um, but but it's it's happening across a wide number of regimes. It tends to be happening in places where there are where there is reasonably good infrastructure, where there is proximity to Europe, where there uh, where there are. You know, you, you need you need a lot. You know, one of the you talk to some of these factory owners 
Um, and, and the thing they complain about is not the quality of workers or the quality of roads. They do complain about the quality of roads uh, and quality of infrastructure and things. And they complain about everything. But they're, they're you know, this is this is the thing. It's always a struggle and they're always taking risks. But what they one of the things they really compare complain about is, is the availability of good managers. They need middle managers. They need accountants. They need someone who can run their factory floor. They need someone who can run the HR department. They need someone who can handle mergers and acquisitions. They need someone who can help them do due diligence on a buying and acquiring new companies. They need they need all of these skills that we don't usually think about as as poverty or development economists. And that's where they feel really tight. They say, I can do so much. I have all this capital. I've made all this money in real estate or trading or my money or ill-gotten gains or whatever, wherever they got this money. And and they're like and, and they only have so much time and they can so they really need people who can organize and and they and and they need people who can help them execute transactions, whether it's buying company or or helping them build sales contacts and do things overseas. So so that's why places like Kenya and Ethiopia uh, and Ghana and elsewhere, I think, are really attractive because these are places that are not just pretty politically stable, whether they're democratic or not. They're pretty politically stable, but they also um, they also have a like a, a middle class, however small, and an upper class of pretty educated, pretty capable people who who can who can do this kind of thing for them. I mean, that's just fascinating. Just I don't know why it came to my mind the, the uh, analogy with the with the football team. You know, you can have a great offense, great defense, but if your special teams get all their punts blocked and everything gets run back for a touchdown, or everything gets run back for a touchdown, you don't win any games. You got to yeah. have that. There's a certain supportive cast that you don't think about when you think about a factory, because we're only economists and academics. We tend to think about, well, there's a manager and there's a bunch of workers, but of course, there's that huge level of other folks who help make the thing go and. Um, that's, that's very interesting. I think that's one of the biggest constraints on these on these companies. Is at the end of the day, um, I think some of the reasons we saw some of these factories doing well, some doing very poorly, is they really struggled, especially the sort of middle management, the the, the people who would manage human resources and organize the factory floors. I, I think they just really struggled to get good people. It's also an early stage, you know the. Because because these firms are new, there's just a lot of learning going on. So so we're really careful to sort of scope what we're doing. You know, this is we're talking about an early industrializing society, a place that has, you know, in some ways, it's had a long history of manufacturing. Ethiopian um, firms have been making shoes for 70, 80 years and exporting to Italy. And so th- there's probably and then. I, I mean, an awful lot of shoes have also been made in Italy, but there's also a decent chance that if you bought a pair of Italian shoes, it was made in Ethiopia, and then somebody in Italy stitched on the tag that said "made in Italy," <laughs> and and then and then and there you have it. So, so there has been a long history of private sector production in Ethiopia, um, but not on this scale. That's what has been new, and and indeed, even in the last eight or ten years, there have been ups and downs, not just because of the ups and downs in the global economy, that's actually affected Ethiopian Africa less, in part because they haven't been so integrated with the world economy. Sure. It's It's been going up and down with, with, with domestic politics, which which actually right now, for example, are which looked really stable are actually not right now. We were, we, we, we've actually, some, some stuff I'm doing in Ethiopia right now, we've had to stop because because there's a lot of unrest right now, some popular unrest and opposition to the government. And and so this is actually not just crippling research projects; it's it's crippling a lot of industrial production. So <clears throat> let's um, let's move to the study. Uh, what what were you trying to figure out here? What was the goal of what were you trying to understand? Well, so so in some sense, it was pretty simple. Like there, if there if we have this belief, if I'm if I'm right that this if our, if I was right that that these jobs are better than the alternatives. Um, what we wanted to do was to say, well, let's 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 test that out. Let's since since you have 300 people lining up for these jobs, um, why not look at take the ones who are qualified and instead of taking the first 50 in line who are qualified for the job and hiring them and everybody goes home, which is really what was, what was typically done. Why not see if we can find a factory owner who will say, okay. Let's find the 150 who are qualified, and instead of taking the first 50, we'll we'll flip a coin, uh, and we'll we'll 
we'll take the 50 people out of those 150 qualified applicants as, as random and we'll follow them over time and we'll look at what happens to their 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 incomes and their health and their career trajectories over time and if we have to we'll follow them for for 10 or 20 years um and we'll see do is it hard to get a job if you don't get this job are they really queuing and if they aren't lucky enough to get the job from that queue do they do they find another job or do they do they are they forced to go back to agriculture how long do they stay in these jobs are there short-term risks are there long-term risks and and let's let's sort of let let's sort of get something that both the activists and the and the boosters could say yeah you know we're 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 curious what the result is and so that's what we did i i was um uh, yeah, I, I, I well, I, I guess you could say I, what I did is for I had this idea as a graduate student ten or twelve years ago, and I and I always thought, well, every time I meet a factory owner, I'm going to feel them out, and and I did. Once in a while, I'd be on a plane to Uganda um, to work on one of my projects, usually related to poverty or conflict, and I'd maybe sit beside a factory owner and I'd say, oh, here's this idea that I have, and they'd usually sort of look at me a little funny or. Or they, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't leap at the possibility. They didn't, but they, you know, I was also just this person they met on a plane and I was a graduate student. I uh, probably didn't approach it well. And and so it never really materialized. And then? Oh, and well, so I, I wanted to pause because I feel like you might <laughs> want to jump in with something else. The um, No, you want to jump in with something? What should I have asked? <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 uh, uh, I, I know. I think that's probably well. So what happened is in um, I was I was at a conference in London, and there was a Ethiopian businessman who uh, I used to <laughs> I used to say he was the Donald Trump of Ethiopia because he was sort of a real estate mogul, and that I just seems like an inappropriate. Yeah. yeah, that seems like an, <laughs> that's it's no longer the basis in which that's not the first thing that people associate with Donald Trump anymore. Uh, but back in 2009, he, he'd, he'd made a lot of his money in real estate. He'd also actually originally made a lot of his money in investment banking in the U.S. His, his, he was sort of grew up as an expatriate Ethiopian. Um, and he was giving a talk to a group of development economists, something called the International Growth Center. Uh, and, and he was saying, and the thing I just told you about where I said, what here, what firm owners want is they want managers and they want m and Merchants and acquisition specialists. So they want, you know, he was lecturing this group of economists saying, you guys, you know, you don't quite get it. This is what we, this is the big deal. And this is what we need. And I just want to help you understand what I think the real problem is. And so, so, so I, so I just channel him and the many other firm owners I met after that. And I approached him afterwards and said, that was terrific. And I really enjoyed talking to him. We kept chatting and I said, well, you know, I've had this idea, you know, I think that these, that your firms not only help achieve growth, but I think that they might actually be tools of poverty alleviation. Here's an easy way to answer that question. And he said, that sounds great. Let's do it. And, and so literally five or six weeks later, we were on the ground in Ethiopia, um, launching, launching, doing the first randomization. Uh, as he was adding, he had a water bottling plant, uh, and basically he 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 and he was adding a new line. He was, I think, he was he'd been producing like the the small bottles and the one liter bottles, and I think he was adding like a five liter bottle manufacturing line, and he needed thirty new people, and so there we had it. You know, we just scrambled, and it all came together. So um, the, the idea, the the, the three categories, is what's um, important for people to keep in mind, right? So you have you have a group of people who you hope are similar and that they mm -hmm. all are qualified to work at the plant. Mm -hmm. A third of them are going to work at the plant. A mm -hmm. third of them talk, – talk about how you divide up the sample. How many people did it end up being and across right. how many firms? Right. So, well, the first thing I should say because I love this story is even – you know, this is an example of where things are. not there, there weren't a lot of manufacturing firms. Like beverages are like one of the first – um, things that people produce locally and ex and not at, not for export for domestic consumption. You know, it's really heavy, heavy. to yeah. send water around, and water is usually around. So bottling water is like step one. And and this wasn't done when he went to Ethiopia, sort of around two thousand five, two thousand six, back and thought, I'm going to become this this mogul. Um, and when he drifted from real estate into this this stuff, he um, he he would go and he'd buy a bottle of water at the store. It was three dollars. 
and it would come from like Yemen or or Israel or something like that. And he said, we are the source of the Nile and we are importing water from the Middle East. But this is patently ridiculous. And so he started the first water bottling plant. Um, and 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 he did phenomenally well. And then like six other water bottling plants grew up. And so at the time he was expanding, he was expanding into new product lines because he was trying to diversify away from this competition. But he's also struggling to maintain his profits because he was facing a lot more competition. So he was also trying to open a whole bunch of other firms, which is where we thought we would get more and more more and more um, participants. He, he had visions of opening six or eight or 20 firms. Now, as a matter of fact, he didn't. Um, he ended up deciding that actually my profit margins, gosh, you know, it's, he, he says, I'm actually much better at at being a real estate mogul and I, and the, of the 40 cranes you see around the city, 20 of them are mine. And maybe I'll focus on 30 of them being mine rather than really trying to, you know, people are just going to copy me if I go into manufacturing. Yeah. And so, so I, but I, I, you know, people aren't copying me on this other much more capital intensive activity that they can't enter. So I, now that I've helped ignite this thing, I'm going to step back. And so, so we had our first little cohort of, of 30 people. Initially, I think it was 30 people. It was just, this, we almost call it our pilot, 30 people in this water factory and 30 people who, who, who by the flip of the coin, didn't get into the job and we, we'd start tracking them. But then we had to sort of say, well, we're not gonna have a study of 60 people. Well, that will be interesting, but it'll be a case study. It won't be like a statistically precise uh, uh, or generalizable kind of, exercise. So we basically started beating the bush. We went around and, you know, there may be, I would say there's probably somewhere between 500 and a thousand manufacturers in the country. Uh, and we probably talked to at least half of them over the next year or so. And the first surprising thing to me was that when we brought up this crazy idea of randomizing who they hire, um, most of them thought, oh yeah, that sounds interesting. We'd be willing to do that. Uh, provided, and this is important, provided they were basically the kind of company that has huge unskilled workforces. So, so you're not going to do that with your engineers if you're like a pretty sophisticated engineering company. Um, but if you're, if you're the kind of company, and this is the kind of company that is in a lot of low-income countries and has the most manufacturing employment, if you're doing garments, uh, which is just a lot of cutting and sewing and packing, or if you're bottling water, or if you're uh, spraying and um, and and packing and cutting, uh, almost an industrial style production in greenhouses of chives or spinach, or all sorts of other really low skill things where people are basically interchangeable, then 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 yeah, whatever. We're already ad hoc. You're going to answer an interesting question. You're also going to collect all this data that's going to tell us where people go. Do they get jobs that are competitors? Why do they leave so often? And so forth. And 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 so a lot of them were interested in it. Um, but the problem was that not all of them were adding a production line of like say 50 people. And if they right. were, they want to hire three people. That's not yeah, it. they're going to hire five or six people. It just wasn't worth our time. Even ten people. That that's that's a pretty big expansion. If you have, if you have a firm of 150 people, adding ten people every six months is is some serious growth. But that's that wasn't what we could. That wasn't our. Um, that wasn't going to work for us. So we needed these these firms that were moving ahead in leaps and bounds. And and we found. We basically, I think we found maybe 10 or 12 and six of them actually happened. This was the other thing. I, it was so interesting first to see certain plans go awry. So a lot of firms have big plans, um, and, but they went awry for interesting reasons. You get market changes and, and all sorts of uh, other events. But, but also you'd see, you know, they'd say, well, as soon as the machine arrives from India, uh, but the, you know, the government has, it's been sitting in the port for three months because the government won't let it pass through for some reason. And one version of the different kinds of, of sometimes control and repression and ineptitude that you would get from, from this government or really maybe any government. And so there were, there were a lot of frictions that kept, kept them from realizing these plans. Um, and so we had, uh, I think in the end, we had five firms who, some of them hired big chunks of people multiple times over that first year. So I think we ended up having eight, what we call eight cohorts of people. And so in total, maybe about 300, and, 300 to 350 people who got hired by a factory. And the other folks and, you followed were doing what? So 
the other folks, so initially we thought, well, we'll just follow people. We'll have an equivalent number of people who just then go about their lives. And maybe they go and try to get a job at a factory elsewhere, but they probably just go back to whatever they were doing previously, which was mostly, mostly they were unemployed uh, or mostly they were just doing a little bit of odd jobs and they were searching for odd jobs. Um, then we thought, well, you know what, this is, why just compare why just compare this factory job to people's miserable alternative or potentially miserable alternative? What, what if we could make their outside option a little bit better? Like how, how would they prefer that to a factory? And so what we did is we said, well, let's have this other intervention where some of these people who don't get the job will get $300 cash and about five days of business planning and consulting with some people who understand how to who understand this sort of self-employment and this informal sector stuff and will help people think through a really basic plan for spending that three hundred dollars however they please and so in a given factory if there were 300 people lined up maybe 150 of them met the minimum qualifications meaning they were between typically that just meant they were between 18 and maybe 28 uh they were they had a minimum education of maybe eight grade eight or grade 10, and they were not obviously physically unhealthy. That was, that was the extent of uh, job qualifications. And, and if you met that, let's say the 150 people who met that qualification, 50 would be offered the job, uh, 50 would be offered this, what we call this entrepreneurship intervention, which was the grant in this basic training. And then 50 would just, would not receive either and would then go about their business. Now it's uh, whatever the control. That might be. That's the control. Uh, that's well, yeah, what we call the peer control group. So what did you find? And how so, long over what time period? I think it's the first year, right? Right. So we looked, we, we sort of followed people uh, a little bit over qualitatively and a little bit quantitatively over the first couple months with some of the factory data and just with some phone calls. But then we did a big survey after a year where we collected really detailed information about from them and from their family. A lot of these are young women. So this is the first thing I should say is I think about 80% of them are, are women who are in their early twenties. They're generally unmarried. Um, and so, and this is often their first job in the formal sector. And they've, they've been maybe like the most, a lot of them are living at home and they are, uh, and they are, um, They've been mostly unemployed for the last month, and to the extent they're employed, they've been doing informal work. So they've been working in a little shop, or they've been helping on the family farm, or or, or helping in the family shop, or, or doing some petty trading of their own. And so they don't have, a, so they don't look like they're really that productive or have that many good options. And so you can imagine this is so. So they they're they're sort of looking forward to this factory job. They know it's not particularly good. They, they know it's not particularly well paid. The wages aren't great, but it's going to give them 40 or 50 hours of work a week at a low wage, but that's going to give them some stability. So the, the big thing is not just the rise in income. This is what we're thinking at the beginning. The big thing is not just the rise in income. Uh, even if that rise in income is not high, it's just an end to the volatility and the uncertainty that they're no longer going to not know what they're doing the next week. And if they do find something good in the informal sector, they're often doing it for say 30 hours a week, but, but that might only last for a week or two. So, and then they never know when it's going to end. So there, it, it can mean an end to these unemployment spells. So that's at the outset, what we're thinking is, is the big impact. And then basically everything I think I know about the world turns out to be wrong. We, hey, um, hey welcome yeah, to exactly. my world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was the world of humility. Kind of, yeah. And I, you know, we can come back to why I was wrong. I think we, you know, and it's not, you know, Stefan had been working in Ethiopia for 20 years. He's like one of the country's most foremost, the profession's foremost, like agricultural and development economists. So, so, so we were, we were fooled. Um, before you, before so, you say, yeah. well, before you go into that, just, let's just make it clear what you, again, what you're expecting. You're expecting that this, for the factory, let's call them the factory group, the control group and the entrepreneurial group. So the mm -hmm. factory group gets the job. The, the entrepreneurial group gets 300 bucks and a little bit of training the other people, mm -hmm. we just say, well, we don't know what will happen to them. We'll watch them. So in those three groups, you, you, your ex-ante thought, your before-the-fact thought was that the people who get the factory job are now going to have a more stable – it's not a great life, but it's more stable. At the end of the year, they're going to look better financially because they've got – certainly in the control group because they've gotten the job and they're, gonna, they're going to be happier. They're going to have more stability, more regular employment. 
Is yeah, that a good summary? I, mean, I guess the and, the and so the intuition that I had is even if they're not making that much more money, who wants to be an entrepreneur? I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to not know where my income's coming from a few weeks down the road. And so just the stability of this work would be appealing. Um, and so, so there were lots of grounds to think that, so I didn't know precisely what the advantage of this job would be. Uh, I didn't know if it would send them off on over five years on like rising, rising wages as other firms competed for you with, cause you had this scarce experience. I didn't know if the, if, if the firms were going to pay you so much better than you could get in your informal sector. Or I didn't know if it was going to be the same income, but just more stable. And, and so any, anybody's risk averse, right? This is like econ 101, you know, we, I'd rather have, you know, $10 with certainty rather than a lottery where I could either get $5 or $15 uh, by slipping a coin. And, and so, and so if we think most people are risk averse, especially when you're poor, because, yeah. Getting a bad shock when you're poor means death. means can really mean terrible things. Possibly. Well, death for these guys, not death. I mean, these are you know, if you have a grade eight education in Ethiopia and you have a family who can support you, so their outside options in the end, it's sort of like living at home and not having anything to do and not have, being able to contribute to the family and not having any spending money and maybe having a harder time finding a husband or a wife and. And, and, and maybe also bad things happening in the household. Like maybe you're contributing to your younger brother going to private school or something. So, so bad things. Can, but these, these people are not on the margins of debt. This isn't who sweatshops are hiring, at least in, in this case. Okay. Um, so, what, so what did you find? So people really hated these jobs. <laughs> uh, and they tended to quit really quickly, at least some, a lot of them. And, and um, and they quit partly because it was really hard work for kind of a crummy wage. And it turned out that their outside options in the informal sector, even if we didn't give them a grant, their outside options in the informal sector were actually much better than they looked like at baseline. For someone starting out in the labor market like these young women, their, actual, their outside options actually look pretty good over time compared to the factory. Uh, and the ones for whom that wasn't true tended to stay in the factory. So some people tend to stay, but very few. So by the end of the year, maybe, first of all, like 10% didn't show up on the first day, which was our first clue. We were like, what's going on? Why aren't they showing up? Uh, and we try to find out. And it, it, all, over time, we realized that something was going on. And then after a month, like the people were quitting all the time. We we're like, why are they, why are they quitting? What's going on? And we talked to them and we tried to figure it out. And, um, and then by the end of the year, maybe like two thirds had not just quit that factory, but they'd left the industrial sector altogether. And they were doing not bad in the informal sector. They, 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 and, and, and then, but the amazing thing, I think, for us, and maybe the most important thing, is that um, if you, and, and the thing that we want to go back to understand better, if you, if, you got, if you were offered this factory job, even though you quit, even though most of you quit within a month or two, if you got this factory job, uh, a, a year later, the rate at which you were reporting some kind of serious health problem had doubled hmm. just from getting the offer, just from working there for like 20 weeks. Uh, you had maybe something like, so the people who in the control at, at the beginning, everybody was healthy. So there were no reported health problems. And at the end of the year, the people in the control group, you 4% on the particular day we interviewed them, 4% were reporting various kind of health problems. And that could have been a cold or it could have been, you know, they lost a limb or it could have been chronic back pain. Um, often, often these were moderate. I wouldn't say they were serious conditions. I think they were like moderate to discomfort to, to things that would inhibit your enjoyment of daily life, but not cripple you. So there's, you know, so, so 4%. And then in the group that was offered the factory job, it was 8%. Uh, and, and so that's a big, that's a big difference. Yeah. I, I'm, as a, um, piece of folk wisdom, I've always carried around an economist told it to me, so it must be true, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, if you change jobs, get married, get divorced, move any of those three things, you're much more likely to get sick. And if you do all three, so if you, you get divorced and, and move to a new city to restart your life and change your occupation, say you're not just transferring, uh, you're really much more likely to get sick. So, you know, some of that. Really? I, why, why is that? I don't I've never know. heard that before. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. But let me tell you, every time I see a sick person, I, I confirm my bias because I say, oh, oh, they just moved here or they I always find some. Uh, but I think I think 
you know, I think the casual intuition, it may not be true, but uh, the casual intuition is that all those things are stressful, right? Right. Uh, change is stressful for most people. And so their immune system is is compromised to some extent. And so it's not, you don't lose a limb if you get married mm-hmm. or divorced or move, but you, you're you much more likely to have the flu, to be run down. You don't sleep as well. There's a whole bunch of I can imagine, right. may not be again. Right. <laughs> so that, I hope some so listener out there case, can confirm yeah. this is a true statement. If someone could give me the study that, the, <laughs> that my yeah. economist friend quoted to me that I somehow took as true, even though I probably wouldn't if I looked at it more carefully. But So that could be true here. I don't think that's what's going on here in Ethiopia for a couple of reasons. One is um, we, we, we basically, we asked, you know, we asked a lot of people, about their levels of both finan- financial anxiety and also symptoms of depression and anxiety. So it's all self-reported, but um, but we don't actually see self-reported higher stress levels or anxiety levels uh, in either group. You, partly, I think being in this, this is, I mean, I actually thought that the, the, the group, whatever chain, whatever stress change brings, I actually thought that having the stable income was going to reduce your anxiety uh, and that being an entrepreneur would raise your anxiety. That was my... We actually saw the opposite. Yeah, well, you'd think um, that, but that's because yeah. you don't know anything about entrepreneurial right. or factory life in Ethiopia, as it turns out, right? Well, uh, yeah. And, and I, so what did we learn? Like, so people complained. So first of all, people kept complaining about kidney problems. And I was like, what are you, what is a kidney? And, and so we looked into this and, and so kidney, I think kidney problems is one way that people, is one manifestation of sort of back pain. So, so basically any kind of sort of joint back pain in that area it can be colloquially referred to as, as kidney problems. So you can think of it as like back pain and repetitive stress problems. That was, so that's not surprising from physical labor, repetitive physical labor. But the other thing that is people kept talking about, there's a lot of chemicals. So listen, I want to, first thing I want to say is you go into these plants, you know, there's safety plans on the wall. There's usually a clinic on site. Um, the, they're well lit places. They're clean. You know, they, I, it's not, it's not the best work environment in the world, it's but you look around and it's, yeah, it's not frightening. It's no worse. You know, I worked in a, I worked in a kitchen and I've worked in, you know, a warehouse and, and things of this nature in the past. And it was no on the surface. It looked no worse than any of those kinds of environments. Um, and uh, but but it turned out, I think there was just a lot of problems either with chemicals or with particulate matter. So particulate matter, if you're cutting, if you're in a giant room cutting cloth all day, there's lots of little particulate matter, like little not so microscopic and not so microscopic bits of stuff floating around. That gets in your lungs and then you have respiratory problems. Um, or or the other thing chemically, like you're, you know, there's a lot of cleaning agents um, in these commercial farms, these factories with sort of industrial style production for spinach or chives, there's a lot of spraying going on of chemicals and there's a lot of chemicals involved in the plants. And and people are wearing some basic productive gear. And the, but they even have a clinic on site that's monitoring people's toxicity in their blood levels. And if your toxicity in your blood levels go uh, above a certain level you, on your like bi-monthly test, then they rotate you off into like the packing area or something. And then three months later, you can go back to the spring. Um, this reminds me. Shoes, yeah. This reminds yeah. me when I when I moved to Los Angeles in 1987, uh, and after about a, a month there, I had a, I realized I had a sore throat. And it, would, and it didn't go away. And I eventually decided, I don't know if it was accurate or not, I eventually decided it's because the air, uh, which mm. in those days, uh, you couldn't see the mountains in uh, Los Angeles uh, from the city most days. It's very rare. Now I've gone back and they're, they've, things have changed. They've put more uh, restrictions on car pollu- automobile emissions. And the mountains, you can see the mountains on most days, and it's really a beautiful thing. But I realized, you know, I think it's just my body doesn't like this, whatever's in the air here. And uh, after a while, it went away, and I thought, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, yeah. <laughs> is that is that good? Uh, it's probably not good because I'm just yeah. now not even aware that I'm taking in some toxins. So some of yeah. this, of course, is that, you know, the change in environment, again, is part of this. Right. But part of it is also some of those environments are probably not so good for you. Um, yeah. And some people would say, you know, I, oh, you know, the biggest problem I faced, one of the reasons I left was I was fainting a lot from the chemical smells. So, you know, that, that, I know this is partly what we're looking into right now as we go back after, we're trying to go back after four years. We'll see if that happens because of this political instability. Um, But, uh, but, but, but if, you know, it's one thing to sort of get a scratchy throat or, 
in the health particular matter, which is pretty serious. You know, you can see reports from New Delhi today is is like the hot spot on the planet where you hear about people going developing really terrible health problems just as a result of the smog. Um, but now you're now you're fainting from fumes a few times a week, and, yeah, and doesn't seem like a good thing. No, it's not. It's not a good thing. Um, and it's not. You know, it's not like this is limited to Ethiopian factories. I mean, there's a lot of chemicals in a lot of factories and in in the developed world as well. And, and most of the time, there's protections, but but I don't know if they're adequate or not. But the bottom line is, is that, and and we should mention that it's about a thousand people. It's not a hundred, uh, right, right? Overall, it's a pretty big and sample. It's only five. The, the thing we've also said, it's all, but it's also just five firms. Correct. So we've had to be really careful. You know, if we could have done this with a hundred firms. In in twenty different countries, that would be a better study. But give us uh, that, just, yeah. But just to summarize, the at the end of the year, what proportion? I want to make sure I get the numbers right. What, roughly, what proportion were still working in the factory that they had started with the year before? Let's see. So I would say, out of out of, so let's say there were three hundred people who got offered the factory job. It was a little bit more, but three hundred is a nice round number. Uh, roughly a hundred were in any factory job by the end of the year of the ones who'd been offered the initial factory job. So, so that meant 200 of them had started, worked for 10 or 20 weeks and quit. Um, and, and so, so, so about a third were still around. Now, how many of those were in the actual exact factory job? Most, but not all. Like people were moving around and this was the other interesting thing. So the, in the control group, the group who didn't get a factory job offer, turns out that twenty uh, percent of them, twenty um, percent of them, so out of that three hundred, like sixty, uh, sixty had found a job in a in a in a factory somewhere else. Usually not the the study factory. Um, usually with some other factory in the in the area. Uh, and so and so in the end, what we what we did is we had a. We, we basically raised the probability you were still in a factory job by about 12 percentage points now, um, which is substantial, but it's not huge. It turns out that that being offered a factory job wasn't so transformational because these other options came along. What we're doing by after a year, maybe the difference, you could, the way you can think about the difference between the treatment and the control group is not that they're just slightly more likely to be in a factory job, but they sort of had ex- more exposure to factory jobs. So if I remember the numbers right, the average person who was offered the job uh, had had spent an average of 20 weeks in a factory that year because of all these quit rates. And the average person in the control group had only spent 10 weeks in a factory. And so when I taught, so that's what makes these health impacts so amazing to me, which is that this health impact is coming just from an added 10 weeks of exposure to a, fac- a factory. So so basically like for every month you're in a factory you're you're facing more than a percentage point increase in these sort of self-reported health problems. Well, I would think if you told the factory owners that, which I assume you did or will, mm-hmm. they're going to be very interested in that. I assume. Yeah, you know these are yeah, and you know the I think one of the reasons the factory owners were interested in the study is they were genuinely concerned about these issues you know these were not sort of the the movie villain capitalist types these are people who genuinely wanted to to know if they were um if they if they, if people's health were you know they were they had these protections because and they thought they might be adequate well, it's hard uh, and, it's hard to be a, mo- a good movie villain capitalist uh, raking in the <laughs> dough if your workers are quitting on you because they're fainting so yeah exactly. that's pretty practical well, well, they were, you know, that this is, here's the thing, like it turned out that they were aware that there were turnover issues. They would always complain about turnover. Uh, we didn't know the scale and the scope of it until we started following this panel of people. No, for sure. um, and, 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 and they didn't know why people were, these just, people would just quit eventually and, 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 and they would fill the ranks and, and the, the information wasn't always moving up the, the chain to the very top about what was going on and why and what the issue were. And and, and this is this management problem that I mentioned, right? This is, this is, this is a real issue. And, but the firms are constantly experimenting with ways to try to get for workers to stay. So, so they're, they're, you know, they're starting, they started the clinics before we ever came along. For example, they were offering, they're often offering lunches. They were providing like a bus was going around the neighborhood. Most people lived locally. These aren't migrants coming from the countryside. These are people who mostly live locally and, but they're, they're helping them with the commute. And, and though the firm's doing all these small things, the one thing they're not doing is raising wages, which is, which is interesting. Um, 
And there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, I mean, the obvious one is it's very expensive to raise wages. And, and so still, maybe we're still problem. getting and they're still getting workers, even though and they don't stay very long. Up. Yeah. And, turnover and not, production production. Turnover is not so costly if you don't have high training costs. And yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, exactly. They, they were certainly turning a profit. I mean, the mystery is whether or not if they could get their act together and and uh, and, and and have people say maybe they could be more profitable. We can, can maybe come back to that later. The the. Um, I would say the the, the 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 other reason you know, but they were also they, they had a lot of these firms had cash flow problems. So just like these individual entrepreneurs have yeah. cash flow problems, <laughs> you know, it, it just paying the wage bill was really hard every month. Sure. You know, they're not getting paid all the time, or their cash is coming in lumpy, and so and the wage bill is like one of their biggest cash outlays every month. So it's not just that it wasn't profitable or not to they, they were like fundamentally constrained and and so so raising the wages would actually uh, exacerbate this cash flow problem that they often had so we're, we're getting a little low on time we haven't talked at all about the three the third or 300 or so people who got the 300 dollars. Right. so how did they do relative to the people who got the factory job or or got nothing the control group right so so basically they they ended up um, not they ended up starting small businesses, so they they take about a third of the money and save it, and a third of the money and they might spend it on this or that, and a third of the money would get invested in some kind of small business. They might buy buy and sell charcoal or manufacture charcoal, or they might get some livestock, or they might uh, start a little shop. Those are very common things that they would do with about a hundred bucks, and then they go from they basically increased their earnings by a third. So I think they were earning like, if I remember right, they were earning maybe a dollar a day. And so they went to earning like a dollar and 33 cents. Those aren't exact numbers, but that's, that's big roughly, increase. but yeah, that's a big increase. Um, you know, it's not life changing, but it's pretty, close. it's, it's yeah, pretty <laughs> close. And, um, and they were happier and they had less financial anxiety. Um, then, they, then happier and less anxiety relative to before or relative to the, Two other groups relative to the two other groups, hmm. um, and they weren't necessarily working more hours. They would lick a little bit more. Basically, if you if you didn't if you weren't in the factory, it turns out, I guess the simple way to think about it is if you weren't in the factory, three out of four weeks you could find some other kind of work, and when you had work, you could probably get thirty or forty hours of work, but at any moment you might not have a week of work. And, and that might be you, you work at three out of every four months or three out of every four days or three out of every four weeks. But, but you would have some volatility there in, in how much work was available. Um, that didn't change a whole lot with the, with the people who got the grant. But that informal work was still pretty volatile. But, um, but first of all, it was a lot less volatile than I thought. So that's a lot more work than I thought people could have gotten outside the factory. That's, certainly it was a lot compared to what they had in the months before the intervention. So they're – their counterfactual life was actually not so bad. But then basically when they were doing work, they, because they had this capital, they were more productive, their profits were higher. And so without working more hours, they were getting more cash. And that's where that extra 33 cents on the dollar was coming from. So we're out of time. I, I just, uh, I'm going to, I found this extremely interesting. Uh, every, uh, every aspect of it, our general conversation, the specifics of this experience. One lesson you could say, I, as the outside observer, has learned from your results is that um, that Chris Blattman learned more about himself than he learned about hmm. the workers of Ethiopia. That the workers that, that poor people find ways to make do. Some things are a little better than others. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. getting three hundred bucks is really great when you're poor, and it helps a little bit and and makes a difference. And if Working in a factory for some people was was worth it. Others, maybe most of them, it wasn't. And they move around. They try different things. And it sounds like it's a little more dynamic and uh, alive than than I might have thought, maybe than you might have thought. So why don't you finish by telling us what you think you've learned and where you think you might go next with this kind of work? It's obviously not – she says only five factories. It's 1,000 people. It's not the decisive study of sweatshops. It's just provocative right. and interesting. Yeah, and I, I do want to stress that. I, I guess I'd say two things. One, I, I do want to stress that you know I, I greatly hesitate to, to go beyond five firms or even Ethiopia. So so who knows who knows what's going on in the wider world? You know what 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 you said about you know, Chris Bobbin learning something about himself. It's true. So you know field experiments 
all field experiments have turned out to be like this for me. Um, on some level, they they're like this intellectually dead thing that sometimes I get very frustrated that I I work on a lot because it's not it's not that comp. You know, you run a very simple regression and and you uh, and you you randomize at the beginning and and then there's a huge amount of logistically and there's a lot to think about. But and, and it can be an intellectual enterprise, but but on some level it doesn't feel very sophisticated. But then actually on the other level, I guess. It forces you to interact in the world uh, and intervene in the world and to follow people over time and to get into um, and actually also have to manage. So you just learn so much about how the world works. It gets us out of it gets me out of my office and it gets me spending days and weeks understanding how factories work and talking to floor workers and factory owners. And and then it turns out that some assumptions that I have turn out to be maybe not just false, but sometimes the opposite turns out to be true. And and I actually think this has been one of the great contributions of field experiments to economics right now is it's not the fact that like, who cares about the point estimate? I mean, I care about the point estimate. I care like that we've gotten some finding that is important or counterintuitive, but, but I think it's just getting a huge chunk of people out there interacting in the world and, and, and figuring out how, how things work or don't work. And as a development economist, that's very important because so many, you know, so many things, whether it's uh, getting to the point where now, now I have this sort of stylized fact in my, my head about how important management is to an organization or, and I have these ideas about how, um, how actually I, I think that one of the things these firms really lack is good human resource management. And if they, were able to improve their human resource management. I think some of these problems and and some of these turnover and and some of the the profitability of these factories would all be improved. Um, that's actually not where I'm going to go with my research. This has been a nice little side route for me, and I hope many people pick up this agenda and run with it. I'm still going to keep working on um, you know youth gangs and, and violence and 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 things and and poverty alleviation in places with sort of gangs and violence, uh, but but. I'm, you know, my my view of what it means to develop and what the barriers are and where growth is going to come from is forever changed. I think you need to start an MBA program. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my guest today has been Chris Blattman. Chris, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.